Have you been told you need to stop doing what you love, whether it's exercise, running, or a sport? Well, here at Dynamic, we don't like that answer. In this podcast, we'll talk to leaders in the health and wellness space from Southwest Florida to get the solutions you need to get you back to doing what you love. Welcome to the Dynamic Naples Podcast. What's going on? Dr. Chris here. Today we have a very special podcast. Today is episode number 100, which I'm very excited about. So I thought, who better to bring on than one of my own team members, Amanda Sal- Dr. Amanda Salazar. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. How are you? She recently got her doctorate. So <laughs> tell people what that is. Do- doctorate in what? Occupational therapy. Yes, that's very exciting. When did they start the doctorate for OT? Is that somewhat new? I don't know that it's new. It was around when I was getting my master's 11 Mm -hmm. years ago or so. But the way it was set up back then, at least at the school I was attending, you had to get your master's and then go practice for at least a year before you could come back and work on your doctorate. Okay. I took a little bit more of a traditional route, obviously, because I already had my master's. So I went and got my doctorate doctor separately but they do have entry-level otd programs now similar to what you guys do in pt but it's not mandatory for us yet yeah and actually you know just so everyone knows we have a whole bullet point list here of things we want to talk about but i'm already <laughs> going off the rails here so um i do want to start with let's explain to people what a doctorate really is so i you know i hear this a lot as a pt oh you're not a real doctor right i'm sure yes. well <laughs> You're kind of new to it, but that may be something you hear as well. A doctorate, everybody, is just a level of education. You can get a doctorate in architecture. You can get a doctorate in mathematics. Indiana Jones is a a doctorate in uh, (laughs) archaeology, right? So so just because we have a doctorate does not mean we can prescribe meds. So there is a difference between us and a medical doctorate. Anyway, I don't know. I just want to get that out of the way. Yeah, but and I get a lot of questions too. Well, why don't you just call it a PhD then? Well, so a PhD is very specific. That's like, okay, I got my doctorate <laughs> and now I want to be the expert, the, what they call them, shmees, subject matter expert. Expert on, for me, it'd be like hip impingement, for example, something I'm pretty good at. And I'll go in and do a year's worth of like research, write a whole thesis, kind of push the evidence forward on one specific topic. And then you have a PhD, which is also a type of, but it's a, a doctorate of philosophy, right? Is that what it stands for? I think so. I think you can get a PhD in a few other things too. I should have probably read a little bit about this, but <laughs> I'm going to just completely speak off the cuff. I always thought that ours were considered doctorates because they were more in the health, kind of along the line of a medicinal area. Kind of like how we have our Florida health license, even though we're not doctors. I know you can get a PhD in stuff that is not philosophy. Well, I mean, that's just what the abbreviation stands for. But it basically means Uh, you're going in for a very specific topic. Like you want to have a niche. And that is, you're going to study how, for example, for you, maybe how nutrition and lymphatics work together. Something like that would be like a PhD topic. But let's also quickly talk about Oh, yeah, it is Doctor of Philosophy. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, let's tell people what this is between PT and OT is, because I still don't really know. <laughs> I know. we Actually, we were just talking about this as being a topic of discussion for us to really solidify and get our elevator speech down, <laughs> because it's one of those things I feel like you think about it, and it's very clear, but then you try to articulate that to somebody who isn't an OT or a PT, and it feels a little muddy. <laughs> yeah, if you ask somebody in the hospital system, PT does the lower body and OT does the upper body, and that's not right at all. <laughs> that one way I could think I think of it is, is like PT tends to do better with gross movements, whereas OT does better with fine movements. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a difference. I would say OT tends to focus a lot on ADLs, activities of daily life, uh, whereas PT can be a little more broad. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, I, th- I kind of think of OT as being a little more specialized, particularly with the hand. Tell me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, there are a lot of OT. Well, I wouldn't say a lot of OTs, but there's definitely a hand specialty within the field of OT. I also think of it 
a little bit more as like we focus on kind of the functional outcomes of whatever's going on and you guys do a little bit more with the actual exercise the you know the physiology part of things mm -hmm. and yeah. then we focus the on what do you need to do what is this keeping you from doing and how can we figure it out yeah like the OCS for occupation so there there is a part of it. it's like how do we get you back to whatever you have to do at work i mm -hmm. guess that's part of it as well right well that's actually yes but considering work as we look at occupations. It's actually a huge thing that people say, oh, well, I don't, I already have a job or I don't need to get back to my job. I'm fine with that. So we think of occupations as anything meaningful that you consider to be important. So your occupation or your role as maybe a, a caregiver, a mother, or mm -hmm. you know, an employee of somewhere, or maybe you are really passionate about painting and you've had a stroke and now that's affected and you know, you can imagine if that's something you're passionate about and you're unable to do it, that's going to affect your mental health. And so we are able to really look at the whole person mm -hmm. and uh, approach treatment that way versus and not saying you guys just do this, but versus just looking at, OK, you had a stroke. What are the neurological implications right. and focusing primarily on that? We Yeah, or, I mean, PT and OT are like cousins, right? Or mm -hmm. like pretty much the same thing. We have the same scope of practice. If there's any differences, I'm not aware of them, but you can do what I can do and pretty much vice versa. It's just our approach is slightly different. It's a slightly different paradigm. That's that's the only real difference in my mind. Yeah. I, I think the differences are pretty small in the scope. Yeah. I can't think of any off the top of my head either. I, I do think maybe the differences on the doors that open up in the future may be a little bit different, right? So for example... Becoming hand specialist is a thing that OTs tend to do more than PTs, uh, like orthotics and bracing and stuff like that. OTs tend to get into more than PTs, not, not as a rule. Um, and then, of course, we have your specialty. Well, again, PTs can do it, but I think you are very well suited for lymphatics. So I let's... agree, but you know, in my personal experience, and I don't know what the actual numbers are across the board, but... I've always encountered far more physical therapists that are lymphedema certified versus occupational therapy. Um, but I agree with you. I think it seems like it fits a little bit better into the way we approach um, treatment. So. Yeah. OTs tend to have a little more of a, I think they call it a top down approach. So let's dive right into the lymphatic system. So um, the lymphatic system is it's almost like a, the neglected system. Like you learn about it in school and you kind of learn, oh, it's like the body sewer system. But it turns out there's like way more to it than that. So how would you, like if someone was like, like if your kids were like, Amanda, what is the lymphatic system? How would you describe it? So I would say first off, I would kind of explain some of the main functions. You know, it, it obviously helps maintain fluid balance. It It's an important part of the immune system because it helps with, um, you know, that immune response. It actually can create white blood cells and, and send all that stuff. Um, inflammation is probably lymphatic fluid. Um, it also is really important for nutrient transport. So there are a lot of things where your blood needs to get these nutrients, but it's not capable of breaking down certain things. So the lymphatic system helps with that. And then... Um, it also is a support for, I hate this word, but detox. It helps remove some of the cellular waste and the toxins from the body. So um, kind of does yeah. a lot of different important things, but because it's almost the second in line, it's kind of forgotten about. Like you said, it supports the circulatory system. It supports the immune system, supports some of those, you know, again, detox things, but it's not the primary factor in most of them. Well, you just brought up an interesting point that I hadn't really considered. I kind of always thought of it as like a, a one-way system where the blood, uh, the you know arteries, and veins connect with the lymphatic system, and just so everyone knows where you have vessels, blood, you know, uh, blood vessels, you generally have lymphatic vessels as well. It's kind of all over your body. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably even more than the actual vascular system. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I kind of always picture the blood dumping into the lymphatic system. But I hadn't really even thought about the idea. That's it's a two-way street, right? So the immune system uh, circulates through the lymph and pushes into the blood. Is that right? 
Yes. So basically it breaks down some of those nutrients um, that like proteins that are too big just as is to go into the bloodstream at the capillary level. Mm -hmm. um, also, it, you know, it breaks down those long chain fatty acids that come from the small intestine, like the seed oil, stuff like that. Um, it, it breaks down a lot of those things and gets rid of it, things that the, the blood can't can't do but yeah they they are very interconnected at the capillary level like you were saying mm -hmm. and it's actually one of the big ways that the lymphatic system moves because you know we talk about this all the time but it doesn't have a heart like the circulatory system does so it relies on that um, you know the opening and closing at the capillary level of the circulatory system to move the lymphatic system and so yeah they're very interconnected like that back and forth all right and so what what can you do to move the lymphatic system if it doesn't have a heart? Like how does it move? There's a couple things. So one of them is is what I was just describing, kind of that um constriction and the relaxing of the circulate, you know, the blood capillaries, and that helps get the velocity up of the fluid in the lymphatic system. Um, there's also some suction properties going on. So pressures basically you know, the fluid wants to move to an area where there's less pressure, which in this case is usually in your chest area, and also muscle pump. That's a big one. Um, two of the big areas where we can kind of really influence the uh, lymphatic system there is with uh, cat, your calves. That's the biggest one. And then also your diaphragm, which is why the diaphragmatic breathing that we tell everybody to do is so important. You actually have the biggest lymph node right there beside your diaphragm called the cisterna chile. So every time you do that big, deep diaphragmatic breathing, you influence the movement of that lymph node. Yeah, it always fascinates me how something so simple as breathing that we take for granted, it, how powerful it is. It affects our body in so many different ways. And like, it really does. Yeah, and Think about how many breaths Sorry. you take a day. The, the way you breathe can have a huge return on investment depending on how you breathe. It's insane. Mm -hmm. When it's so interesting to me, you know, when we're doing a lot of this manual lymphatic drainage, one of the biggest obstacles I have is the way people are breathing. Mm -hmm. It's a very few people come in there breathing in a way that supports their lymphatic system and one of the biggest things I'll tell people is, you know, put your one hand on your chest and one on your belly because they'll be like, well, what am I doing wrong? And yeah. you'll see it. If your hand is moving on your chest, you, you know, you're not taking those diaphragmatic breaths and can really make a big impact. I mean, you just touched on one of like my hottest topics that I talk about constantly <laughs> is how so many people are in this sympathetic state. So, you're, so your nervous system, we can tell mm -hmm. what state you're in. I'm talking about the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, which is fight or flight, or parasympathetic, which is relax and digest. We can look at how you breathe and tell what state you're in. And you can also reverse it just mm -hmm. by changing how you breathe. So unfortunately, our culture is so set up to be in a chronic sympathetic state. And what that means is you tend to chest breathe. So just to be clear, when you breathe, both your your belly and chest should rise. What rises first dictates what uh, system you're in. So the first thing I do, hopefully any new patients are not listening to this. Uh, the first <laughs> thing I do in an evaluation is as soon as my patient lays down, I pretend like I'm just talking about whatever, and I'm watching how they're breathing. And if they're chest breathing, I know they're in a chronic systemic um, sympathetic state. Right. And that means they're never really belly breathing and they're never really pumping out the swelling because that's what the lymphatic system mitigates the swelling. So just just that one thing alone, if you think about that, if all day you're chronically breathing in your chest and you're dealing with a stiff knee that's swollen, you're never getting that lymphatic system pumping because you're never using your belly at all. Well, very minor, minorly, actually, I should say. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you pull into all of that, that a lot of people hold a lot of tension, especially women, you know, just for gyne after gynecological surgeries or after childbirth, um, women tend to hold a lot of tension there, which ends up, you know, correlating to holding your breath and, you know, you're adding to that and making it even worse. Absolutely. 
and, and the people with COPD, that's another issue too. Their diaphragm sort of flattens out and becomes inefficient. And they start to chest breathe chronically too. So smokers are going to have a huge problem with any kind of, you know, chronic smokers with mm-hmm. uh, swelling because of this one idea right here. That they're never really diaphragmatically breathing. Yeah. Well, and, and just to emphasize how important it is, that's the area of the lymphatic system where a lot of those deep lymphatic where all a lot of those deep lymphatic nodes come um, and join kind of the more superficial ones. So you have a few areas like we had talked about where it's taking those, you know, fats out of the small intestine, um, the lymphatic system, the lungs and the deep pelvic cavity, all of those organ lymph nodes that are deep, that are a little harder to affect with some of the things that we do like manual lymphatic drainage that's where the diaphragmatic breathing really comes into play and becomes important because it's one of the only ways that we can really impact the lymphatic system at that deep level. And that's where a lot of it's important. You know, yeah, that's where absolutely. our organs are. Yeah. And I want to point something out. And this is an idea I got from Gary Rinal. I did a podcast with Gary Rinal. He's the anti ice guy, which is a really fascinating po- podcast. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. He talks about this idea of inflammation and swelling being two separate things. Inflammation is this necessary step to healing and swelling is the leftover components, right? This is the swelling is the part you want to get out of there. And one way to do it is to affect the nervous system. Or sorry, the lymphatic system. How do you affect the lymphatic system? Breath work, movement, right? Pump action of muscles. Mm-hmm. All that swelling has to go up to your chest where it drains. And then, then what happens? You pee it out, right, Amanda? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, okay, let's, that's a good segue. Let's go into what you just told me the other day. So back up. You got <laughs> into the lymphatic system. Why? So I originally went to get certified primarily to educate myself because I actually have lymphedema. I had cancer. And because of that, I had a couple surgeries and a lot of the deep pelvic lymph nodes were removed. And due to it being pretty slowly progressing, I didn't have a lot of issues initially, and I was able to deal with it with, um, you know, just some physical therapy and some things like that. But as it progressed, I was concerned that I needed a little bit more support and information. So I figured, okay, there's not a lot of people around here doing this, and I really want to learn how to be able to do this on my own. And through that process, I became pretty passionate about it and decided I wanted to use that, those skills that I learned to help other people in a similar situation. And on top of that, I've continued to learn through you and through other means, um, just how many different things that just that the lymphatic system impacts that I really had no idea. I used to think, okay, if you have lymphedema after you've had lymph nodes removed, it's, you know, this pretty small, very like specific area of the healthcare world. Yeah. And, was, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go, <laughs> no, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say the you know, the more I dive into it, the more widespread I, you know, I find out the effects of this are of supporting this. Yeah. It's really amazing. I, I mean, I was going to say, let's just give a quick shout out to Perry Nicholson. Amanda <laughs> and I did a podcast with him. He's awesome. Uh, Stop chasing pain is his Instagram this guy is probably, I don't know, would you consider him like the expert, the world-renowned expert on the lymphatic system? He's yeah, really I think so. He's tied together <laughs> so many, like lymph, the lymph system in the medical world currently is kind of just thought of as lymphedema, and there's a very like traditional approach to it, but it goes so much further than that. Mm-hmm. He's really the one, in my mind, that's pushing the idea of everything we're talking about on this podcast uh, with the lymphatic system and how important it is to the entire body. So Perry Nicholson, check him out. He's got amazing content. We'll probably mention him a few times in this podcast, <laughs> I'm guessing. Yeah, I feel like he's really modernized a lot of it. So yes. the, the the training that I have is with the more traditional, the Vodder technique that's still considered, you know, a, a very reputable method of doing things. And I do incorporate a lot of that into, you know, the lymphatic stuff that we do. But I like how Perry has taken it beyond that. Okay, yes, we we want to make sure that all of this evidence is there, but evidence comes, you know, we can take evidence, things that we know about the way the gut works. And to to sum to simplify it, 
how he talks about how all the systems work together. The body works together. Nothing does anything alone. And I think a lot of the traditions of looking at it are to segregate all of the systems and look at them individually. And that doesn't really paint a very clear picture. And kind of back to my personal experience, that was one of the things that drew me to him to begin with, because I found myself very frustrated with, okay, being treated the same way in the medical community. Okay, I'll go here. And these doctors are wonderful at dealing with this, but they send me somewhere else to deal with this. And he was really the first experience I had in seeing somebody discuss all of the systems as one. And if one's hurting, the other is hurting. Maybe it's not obvious or direct, but. Yeah. Yeah. This is a problem with uh, Western medicine. It's very siloed. It's very Mm -hmm. stay in your lane. This is what you do. You're the knee guy. You're the ankle guy or you're the lung guy. You're the vascular guy. And what he says, he's got two things I really love. He says, and I repeat all the time, no system works on its own. And pain is the bias request for change. Those those two lines are so succinct and explain so many things. I absolutely love that. So Perry, thank you for those. I use those every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, and it was a big. Um, it, it was one of the big things that inspired me to to do this, to merge all of the stuff that we are doing with mm-hmm. the lymphatic stuff. Yep, absolutely. It's a bit of an east meets west approach. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go into how do you know if you've got a lymphatic issue? Like, what are some typical signs? I mean, lymphedema is the obvious one. So let's first start off by, can you tell people what lymphedema is? Yes. The very simplified, brief version of that is typically when you have two different kinds of lymphedema. Um, So basically, if you're lymphatic system isn't able to keep up with the lymphatic load that it has, you'll see visible symptoms. So for example, with me, I had lymph nodes taken out. And because of that, my left leg will get swollen because there are less lymph nodes there. So the ones that are there get overloaded more easily, and they can't keep up. And so that lymph gets stagnant in that area. And that's typically what is treated with, you know, the water technique that we were talking about. And traditionally in physical and occupational therapy, when you're seeing patients for lymph issues, it's usually that lymphedema. So basically your lymphatic system is either overloaded or it's damaged because lymph nodes have been removed and it can't keep up. Um, Lymph nodes don't regenerate. So once you lose them, they're gone. So lymph collectors they will regenerate, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's why scarring is such a big thing and can impact your lymphatic system. What's the difference between a node and a collector? So the lymph nodes are the bigger, like the vessel, the structure, and the collectors are basically just the way it's transported throughout the body. So they're not as active as the lymph nodes in, in the system. So what you're telling me is if, if you had a surgery and like, say you had a breast mastectomy and you had mm-hmm. a bunch of lymph nodes removed, they don't regenerate. So like what happens to the lymph in that area? Do you just chronically deal it with swelling? So it depends. It depends on how well the rest of your lymphatic system is able to pick up the slack, so to speak, how well your lymphatic system is supported, which is why a lot of those lifestyle choices can really come into play. And not saying that that can completely negate the effects. I mean, sometimes you're going to have the swelling no matter how well you support it, Mm -hmm. but it's very case by case. So one of the big things is why we, you know, we try to prevent scar adhesions and all of that from occurring because, you know, you can't get rid of those once they do. If you have, if a lot of scar tissue forms, it will interfere with those lymph collectors being able to regenerate, Mm. which can lead to the swelling being worse. Because if you've already lost the lymph nodes and those aren't coming back, but you're able to regenerate those lymph collectors so that it can help get the lymph out of that area and into other better working areas of the lymph nodes, it might be able to recover and kind of pick up the slack. 
Um, if you move a lot, like we had talked about, you know, that muscle movement is one of the big things that helps keep the lymph flowing. And, you know, if you can do a lot of those things, you might be able to negate some of that swelling, but. That's so fascinating. So I, I want to point something out too, because I, I tell my patients this a lot. So if you have something like, say you had just had a knee surgery or a shoulder or like a rotator cuff repair, and you've got a lot of swelling in that shoulder and, and it, uh, a fusion is what I'm talking about, which is inside the joint. So swelling you can't even really see. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to move that joint. It's all one system. So you can move the rest of your body and still affect in a positive way the swelling inside that joint. So in other words, say you had a rotator, rotator cuff repair, you're in a sling, you can't move the shoulder. You can still get on a bike, like an assault bike, something with this, the, the, you know, the arms move too, and move three of the limbs and keep the other limbs still so it doesn't get damaged. You can let the, the healing process happen. Mm-hmm. And maybe you bike 10, 20 minutes, something like that, and you're going to still, uh, through the lymphatic system, pump everything out and help the swollen shoulder. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm really that? glad you said that because I, I think that it, it kind of brings up two really – well, one really cool thing about the lymphatic system, and then another pretty big misconception that I run into a lot. So the first is um, basically what we were talking about earlier with that those pressures, that system of, and we call it a suction effect. So if you, did you say right shoulder? <laughs> I didn't say if your right, right shoulder is affected. Right. So we, we have these things called watersheds, which are basically just a way for us to determine what quadrants or what sections of the body, a certain area of lymph nodes is going to kind of take care of. So if you have the right shoulder, you're not able to move it. So you're, you're getting that um, swelling and inflammation there. And you want to then try to support the lymph nodes in the surrounding area. So the right hip, the right inguinal area, or the right, um, you know, your armpit area, you get those lymph nodes kind of activated and, and doing a little bit more and they're able to decongest a little bit so that there's more room, so to speak, for some of that other lymph to be drawn to that area of less pressure mm-hmm. because there's higher pressure where that lymphatic fluid is stagnant. The other thing that that leads to is this misconception that when we're doing, you know, you hear the word massage and you think, okay, we're manually manipulating something. And even though technically we don't call it massage for that reason, we're not using enough pressure for it to really be a massage. The way that we're moving the fluid is actually not through physical touch, so to speak. So if we're moving along your arm, you're not moving fluid out of your arm into somewhere else. What you're doing is increasing the velocity of the fluid within your entire body so that it's more efficient at clearing out all of that and urinating it. So it's basically speeding it up and making it more efficient rather than moving the fluid physically with your hands out of an area. Yes. And you just remind me of the point I brought up earlier that I forgot to get to. <laughs> so you, you got into... I know I'm kind of jumping all around. No, it's okay. It's me too. Uh, so you got into lymphatics because of what happened. And then mm-hmm. what have you done recently that you noticed a huge difference with? Oh, myself. So you know how, how it goes. We're not always the best patients. And I haven't always been very great at taking care of my own lymphedema. So recently I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to start doing it. I I've got, I got some compression. So mine personally is like 30, 40. Um, all that is, is kind of the level of compression. So if you buy compression stockings on Amazon, they're probably going to be 10, maybe 20 Ted hose. Those are a little bit lower level of compression. So based on how involved your lymphedema is and what stages you need a little bit higher. So mine are high enough that I need kitchen gloves to be able to put it on. So I'm not always very compliant with it. So I decided to wear them to work the other day. And I kind of took some data, if you will, to see if I noticed anything different. So I didn't, I actually drank less fluid than I normally do, which side note, being hydrated is one of the most important things that you can do to support your lymphatic system. But this day I did pretty terrible with it. I had maybe 20 ounces of water 
no coffee, no caffeine, um, nothing else to drink. And I went to the bathroom six times before four o'clock and pretty urgently. And again, a little TMI, but none of it was completely clear like it is if you just drink way too much water or something like that. So I, I was a little bit excited about it. I called Chris. I told him, I was like, I think it's because I wore my compression. So I've, you know, I've really helped support my lymphatics. I've increased the velocity of this fluid and I'm excreting it at a, you know, more efficient pace than I normally do. So today, I said, okay, well, let me make sure that I'm not just hoping that that's the case. Um, well, not hoping, but let me make sure that I'm not being dramatic about the results of that. So I drank 40 ounces of water, a coffee and an energy drink and a Diet Coke. And I've only gone to the bathroom twice. I'm not wearing my compression, which is a little closer to my normal, maybe three or four times a day. So I just thought that was kind of a cool. I'm just laughing because we're such <laughs> nerds that you called me to tell me you peed six times. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I'm sitting here like, how much of this story do I want to tell? <laughs> So, yeah. So when you pee frequently after a lymphedema session or from stockings, like that's a sign that your lymphatic system is dumping and getting, getting rid of the swelling. So that's a good Mm -hmm. sign. Right. And a lot of people have different, you know, some different symptoms. So some people's urine will be cloudier or have a little bit of a smell to it. That's not typical. And it really just depends on what's going on with you. You know, if you're somebody who's very well hydrated, you take pretty good care of yourself and your lymph is pretty healthy and moving pretty well, you might not see as dramatic of effects here. But if you aren't doing some of those things or you have a lot of stagnation or one of the coolest cases that I've had is somebody... so. Manual lymphatic drainage is indicated a lot of times after surgery, specifically plastic surgery. And I saw somebody who had just had liposuction done. So as you can imagine, because the lymphatic system is responsible for picking up a lot of those fat cells and getting rid of them, her urine had what looked like flakes in it. It was really thick and cloudy, and it was really interesting. I don't know that it was, you know, from that for sure, but she said it's never looked like that before. And it it was three times after that session and then it went back to normal again. So it was intriguing, if nothing else. That's so interesting. Uh, You know, it, if you've never had a lymphatic mobility, how do you describe it? Lymphatic massage is not the word. So I usually say... Yeah, we're we're doing um, manual lymphatic drainage mm-hmm. or lymphatic support. Kind of depends on what what we're doing specifically, but it's very light, superficial. It doesn't feel like a whole lot, and it's mm-hmm. you know, so it's a part. Of, it's like a bit of a hard sell because you know, people are so used to it, especially in our culture. It's gonna mm-hmm. hurt. It's gonna burn. It's gonna it's gonna feel a certain <laughs> way, and that's not how the lymph system works. It's a very superficial system is it's like sitting between your fascia and your muscle or is that mm-hmm. right i'm not sure um <laughs> <laughs> i like to describe it to people as it's basically a skin tug so that doesn't sound good um <laughs> it's kind of a, a light touch where you are trying to move the skin just enough to stimulate the lymphatic collectors that are mm-hmm. below the surface and to again try to get that speed the velocity of the fluid moving a little bit quicker and the vessels the valves in the lymphatic system are different so they don't have that like one-way door like some of the other ones do with other body systems so if you put too much pressure on them the fluid could go anywhere you know it's not going to necessarily guide it where it needs to go which again leads to another thing that we talk about why is it good for recovery? Nobody ever talks about that. So why is it? And this is one of the reasons. So if if you've really pushed on your muscles or you've done something like gotten a really deep tissue massage or you've gone to physical therapy because you need you know, all of that manual work, you can temporarily impact your lymphatic system negatively because you've put all that pressure on those nodes. And because they are not, it's not an open and shut door, that fluid can go a little haywire. All right. So we kind of 
touched on the signs of some lymph issues and we went, we talked about lymphedema, but there's some other signs that may be more subtle. Like what are some other signs that you can think of? So, I mean, some of the obvious ones could be some fluid retention. Maybe you notice one of, or a few of your lymph nodes are swollen or areas that maybe you don't realize have lymph nodes, like your armpits behind your knees, um, abdominal swelling, um, bloating, constipation, things like that. Honestly, fatigue, scarring. If you have scars, you probably have some stagnation of lymph around that scar, whether you see physical evidence of it or not, because that goes right through where all of those lymph collectors are, like I said. So if you have scar tissue there, there's a path. It's like a roadway block, if you want to look at it that way. And maybe your body's done a pretty good job of navigating around that roadblock, but there is likely something around that scar, especially the bigger scars, deeper scars, a lot of C-section scars, things like that. Hormone imbalances could be an indicator, difficulty falling, staying asleep. Yeah. Whenever I tell a patient to take their socks and shoes off, <laughs> I always look at their sock, right? And does it mm-hmm. leave a sock line? Yes. That's how a long great- does it leave a sock line? <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, a lot of people think it's really normal when you take off your clothes and you have some sort of indentation from the clothing. Typically, unless you're wearing very skin tight things for a pretty extended period of time, that probably indicates some varying level of of inflammation or or swelling of some sort okay yeah so let's talk about who benefits from so obviously if you've got lymphedema you're going to benefit from lymphatic uh drainage what about our athletes could they use everybody everybody will benefit. everybody yep (laughs) just like pt everybody (laughs) But, but yeah so i think athletes can benefit again one of those things that we talked about where it's not necessarily that very obvious um, cut and dry outcome that some of them want to see. But when you exercise, you produce metabolic waste like lactic acid and things like that. So your lymphatic system is really good at helping remove that. Like I said, it takes all of that exercise, like waste and gets rid of it. So it's, it it helps with that. So that can improve and it increase the speed of recovery. Um, it can also decrease soreness because, you know, what, what do you do when you're trying to get rid of that? You move and some of that fluid buildup can also impact mobility. I know you've seen that with some of the people that, you know, they come to see you and they're like, Oh, I have this swelling. So now I can't move this as well. And what do I do? So that can be a good way that it helps with athletes or anybody who's doing pretty strenuous Um, athletic type activities. Um, The lymphatic system also increases nutrient delivery to your body, which is good when you're trying to use those nutrients to perform. Um, It's also good at preventing injury in a lot of ways, because like we've talked about before, it's part of the immune response. So it actually can create white blood cells, so immune cells, and send them to any kind of areas where you have difficulty. And, you know, you see this all the time too, almost every athlete at, at whatever level, if they're pretty consistent with it, they they have those areas, like the spots that always come back, um, you know, their Achilles heel, I guess, so to speak. And a lot of the time the lymphatic system is sending inflammation, you know, it's sending, it's an inflammatory response. So it's sending that fluid there to try and fix it. And so supporting that can aid in the the recovery of that pretty quickly. Yeah. I call it the canary in the coal mine, right? So everyone's got their sort of like the weak link in their armor, right? Uh, And so the equation to get better, and I've said this a million times on this podcast, is stress plus recovery equals adaptation. Adaptation is the thing you want to do. You get stronger, get faster, get better at your sport, whatever it is. So you, you train and create that stress to recover, and then you adapt. That's a hormetic of stress. And then you adapt and become better. And people are always missing out on that recovery piece. This is where lymphatics really thrives. Uh, so whatever your canary in the coal mine is shows up first if you don't recover adequately. That's that's the way I see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
you said that a lot better than I did, but that's exactly what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if you think about it in a general sense, so a lot of the purpose of the lymphatic system is to, you know, support fluid balance and tissue health. Right. And those are two pretty big components when we're talking about athletes and all of that breaking down the muscle, building it back up. So let's uh, let's talk about a few cases because... I mean, this stuff is super cool and a lot of theoretical stuff, but uh, we've seen some really interesting stuff happen mm -hmm. with lymphatic drainage uh, or use of the Mark Pro. Mark Pro is a uh, electrical stimulation machine that pumps the the muscles, and that is what facilitates lymphatic flow. So it's an easy device to uh, sort of manipulate the system if you don't have a, a lymphatic therapist. So uh, one thing, so I had this one patient who had a rotator cuff repair. He was stuck in a sling for over a week. He was not allowed to move his shoulder. And he couldn't sleep because it was throbbing, right here throbbing and aching. I immediately think swelling is the issue or fusion is technically the word because your body does not have a lot of extra space for stuff. So if you have an increase in pressure in any area, it's going to throb. It's going to put pressure on the nerves. In fact, I once had a like a, so I had inflammation at one of my, uh, I think it was a wisdom tooth, actually. And my face swelled out so much. It looked like I had a golf ball in my cheek. <laughs> and my entire face went numb. And it was simply the amount of fluid that was in that pocket putting pressure on my facial nerve. As soon as I alleviated the pain went away, the, the, the tingling went away. So anyways, to go back to this patient. He, he's in a sling for over a week. He can't move his arm. He can't sleep because he's throbbing. So I call Amanda, I say, what can I do for him with your lymphatic knowledge? So we put the Mark Pro on him. We put a couple of electrodes on his pec on the other side and a couple on his uh, mid traps, scapular area, also on the other side and just pumped it for like 20 minutes. And what that did through like basically diffusion, it sucked out the swelling in his surgical shoulder like a vacuum. He slept like the next three or four nights without any pain, no throbbing, nothing. It amazed me. And I did it consecutively with him. Every single time I did that, it happened every single time. It was so cool. It's probably one of the most interesting things about the whole lymphatic system for me, but one of the hardest to articulate to people because it almost sounds unreal. Yeah. But it, it's not, it's, you know, it's obviously based on, you know, the property of pressure and all of that that we've talked about, but it's just really interesting to think about some of the things our bodies can do, especially when it's in a system like this, where we don't often get to see a lot of the outcomes very visibly like that. Right. Yep. Uh, we also had a recent patient too, who had a knee replacement, right? So you're going to get some natural blockage. So, okay, let me back up there too. So what are the main areas of the lymphatic system? Like where there's major collection tubules or nodes or anastomoses? So basically called? the, so, <laughs> well, basically the lymph nodes are, you know, that's where the immune cells are produced. They're kind of the filters that pick up all of this stuff and they do a lot of the, the work, so to speak. And then the lymph collectors are just kind of the transport. They get it from one area to the next. And so the, the main, you have these clusters of lymph nodes throughout your body mm -hmm. and there are cervical lymph nodes in your neck. You have a lot of them in your chest and your armpit. You have them like we had talked about before deep, you know, under that diaphragm, you have them in your lower abdomen, these bigger clusters, you have them in your groin area, and then behind your knees. So those are the main areas where there's a lot of them all together. So. Yeah. So we're talking back of the knee, groin, abdomen, armpit, clav clavicular area, like, and neck, mm -hmm. right? Those are the main ones, right? Yeah. So there, there are two. So you have, yeah, the inguinal, and I hate that word, your groin and your <laughs> lower abdominal area yeah. so they're both Which, and in the lower abdomen a lot of those are deep because they're in there with your organs and all of that so side note i have this weird theory because <laughs> i have a daughter and she's six so and she likes to be tickled 
all those spots are the most ticklish spots. I really think that ticklishness has to do with your body saying, stay away from these areas. Because you think about it, like the superficial system is light and it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's right there. So you tickle someone's armpit, neck, uh, stomach, groin, back of the knee. Yeah, that's super... really interesting. I hadn't yeah. even noticed that. And you know what else I wonder too, because it's so influ- it influences the parasympathetic nervous system so much like we had talked about. Um, one of the things that I, I actually try to do at the beginning of most of my sessions is kind of elicit that you know, where they get goosebumps or something like that with almost a little bit of uh, tickling doesn't sound very professional, but (laughs) a very light touch to try to elicit that and get their bodies to go into that parasympathetic state. Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot of sense. Yep. I don't know. There's something to it. All right. There's one other case too that I want to bring up too. This is a guy who had a knee replacement. And remember that the back of the knee is an area where there's a cluster of lymph nodes. And he had all the swelling in his ankle. And I, I immediately, and I, you know, he took his shoes and socks off, saw the indent line. I said, you need lymphatics. And I contacted Amanda. She worked with him. And she cleared, in one session cleared that up. So tell us about that, Amanda. Yeah, he, he was really interesting for a, a couple of different things too. So oftentimes when I'm doing a lot of this, people will ask, well, how do I know if, if there's something wrong with my lymph, how do I know if it's stagnant? Like you, you know, you like to say, so there are a couple different ways. Sometimes you can feel a little bit of tugging or the skin feels a little bit less movable, but he had a couple different areas. So, you know, he had started with hands in a certain position and I was working and I was like, okay, there's a little swelling here under this left armpit. And when he put his arm down, he said, oh yeah, I had a pretty major surgery and had a huge scar across, but this was years and like tens of years ago. And that scar was still impacting the lymph nodes in that armpit area. So again, we went down to the knee and and all of the ankle and talked about all of that. He actually had swelling in both ankles and we addressed that. That was a pretty typical presentation, but then something else that was interesting is he was asking, will I have any side effects from this? things like that. And I told him because we were speaking, he wanted a little bit more info than a lot of people do. And we were talking about this article I had read about histamines and the lymphatic system. And I told him I've had a couple people who have felt almost like they had a little bit of a head cold or a runny nose, but it went away pretty quickly after. And he started laughing and he said, I was just about to ask you if you could get me a tissue. and." And to backtrack, I, he had said, you know, is this, how do you figure it out? And I said, typically, if people have a certain response of some sort to allergies, it will present that way. Again, this is kind of just one of those things that we've talked about. I don't know that it's an actual thing, but I've consistently seen it where people that have certain allergies or certain histamine or allergic type re- response is not like a, an allergic reaction, but you know, it was histamine responses and he immediately had one and it, it was just like we talked about, it's kind of nerdy, but it's really cool to see a lot of this stuff that you learn about and you're connecting these dots, but then it, it actually happens and just clicks and it's cool. That's so <laughs> fascinating. I have a friend who has this like histamine response. It's like she gets a mosquito bite. It's like, boom, it's a big swollen thing. It's it's it, like so many things do it to her. Do you think that lymphatic drainage might help someone with that? So I don't want to say a direct yes or no, but I definitely think that there are indications that it would be helpful with that. For a couple, Mm. one, my son has a very similar response to mosquito bites and different things like that. His little lymph nodes are swollen pretty easily. And, you know, kids, I, I might get five minutes out of him and almost always it's solved until the next the next time it happens that's so cool i actually was reading an article the same article that we were discussing and one of the only you know statistically significant outcomes that they were finding as far as hormones and and all of that was a decrease in histamine levels don't quote me but in this 
you know, official study that they put out following a traditional manual lymphatic drainage session. So I think that there, there are starting to be different things coming out and research that would indicate that that's a, definitely a possibility. Wow. That's awesome. That's so fascinating. And then on that, the the last thing with him that was interesting, because he had a couple different things, like we had said, that were cool. He actually stood up at the end and he said, wow, I'm not in pain like I usually am. And I know that sounds funny like that, but he, you know, he stood up a little straighter and, you know, I kind of laughed. I was like, oh, you know, and he said, no, I'm I'm not in pain like I typically am. And this is the first time in a while that I haven't been in pain in this, you know, specific way. And I think that that's cool because another area that they're really starting to find lymphatic drainage being able to support or, you know, just supporting your lymphatic system in general is this pain relief area. Yes. And I think that that's really interesting. And and it goes along with, you know, you showed me that one, that one Ted talk. I love to refer back to that for everything. I think we even talked about it with the tickling situation once, but it just, it makes a lot of sense that this can be used to help relieve pain in a certain capacity. Yeah, I I don't think people realize how much pain can be caused by swelling. I mean, you're com- you're compressing nerves, right? local nerves, large nerves doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's people are quick to point to findings on an image like, oh, I've got a herniated disc. That's the issue. There's a bulge. There's stenosis. There's this and that. Swelling. <clears throat> can have a huge impact on pain. I, I kind of think it's the main thing that causes pain. Yeah, I believe it. And, and I'll end my story on a completely unrelated note in true fashion. Um, Apollo got hurt playing baseball, kind of twisted his ankle a little bit, and somebody brought over ice, and he said, no, don't get me ice. I need my lymphatics to fix it. <laughs> that's awesome you know we're always preaching that <laughs> that's so funny oh that my was God. Pretty funny. okay amanda so i think we should wrap this one up did we miss anything <laughs> i don't i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a ton to talk covered about covered a lot <laughs> i'm sure we'll do more on this okay uh thank you so much for listening and we'll be talking to you guys shortly bye Why guess when you can test? Do you get hangry or crash after a carb-heavy meal? These could be indicators that there is a dysfunction in your blood glucose regulation. If left unchecked, it can lead to irreversible changes. If you catch it quick enough, you can make diet and lifestyle changes that will get your levels where they need to be. 88% of Americans are pre-diabetic and don't know it. Diabetes underpins many of the pathologies we deal with in this country, such as obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. For some reason, it is rarely screened with your physician, and if they do test for blood glucose, it's usually with an A1C or a fasting glucose, which can sometimes give you a false negative. NutriSense is a company that supplies continuous glucose monitors. We've paired with NutriSense to get you real-time data to see how your physiology responds to glucose. The NutriSense app lets you track your daily activity to see how food, sleep, exercise, and stress impact your glucose. You can log or import this data into the NutriSense app to see the effect on your blood glucose levels as soon as it happens. Use the code DRCHRIS25 for $25 off your order today. Do you have unexplained pain or do you wonder just how healthy you are? When was the last time you had your blood tested? Blood chemistry analysis is a great tool to stay ahead of any health conditions and now you can have control of your health with Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked is an incredible company that sends blood tests to your home. You can choose from over 30 different tests, whether that's thyroid function, testosterone, micronutrient, cholesterol, or C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation. It is sent to you with free shipping, and you get your results in two to five days. No physician referral needed. Use the code DPT25 for 25% off. You can find links in the show notes. Did you know that you can get started with physical therapy without a physician's referral? Physical therapists don't just solve pain, we get down to the root cause and keep it from coming back. We also discuss all things health, such as nutrition and lifestyle changes. If you feel that you could use some help, let's get on a free consult call. Go to www.dynamicnaples.com and sign up for a free call. 
Also, if you like this podcast, please give us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps us spread the message. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.